We began a study a few months ago on the purpose of the Bible. Why have the Bible and what can it provide for us and do for us? And we've looked at how the Bible reveals God, opens our eyes to see Him and to know Him. It reveals to us God's plan and purpose for His creation. It provides for us and reveals to us, in addition to that, answers to our questions and our needs. It is written in the form of a meta-story. And all of the various parts of the scriptures contribute to that overall meta-story. And we can't take them out of their context without ruining not only their meaning and our understanding of them, but also their contribution to the overall story of Scripture. And we began at the very beginning. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. And we've started there and we've looked at how from that simple phrase we get an understanding of God and of his nature and his character. How he existed before all things. Before time, he existed. He self-existed. No one created God as we came by creation. He just self-existed from all eternity past. And we see him as a person, just like you and I have personality and personhood, so does God. He exists as a spirit. We have physical flesh. He exists as a spirit. And we've examined how that shows itself throughout Scripture. Not just in Genesis 1-1, but throughout the balance of Scripture. It confirms and reaffirms those truths about God. And as we've progressed from that first phrase of that first verse, we come to God created the heavens and the earth. We find God now in action, creating, manifesting himself through creation now. And we see God, the eternal God, has a name. That name that we see throughout Scripture Frequently mentioned, Elohim, a plural noun indicating not fully, but an initial indication of what Scripture progressively reveals. Three persons in one essence. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see God in action. God created the heavens, and the earth. An all-encompassing statement, as if to say God created everything, (laughs) which he did. But it comes as a general statement, an overall inclusive statement. God created the heavens and the earth, thus creating all things. We often use that term created rather glibly, don't we? We look at someone's masterpiece, perhaps a a flower arrangement, or an artistic work, a building, a garden, and we say, look at the beautiful picture that they created. Well, that doesn't at all carry the meaning of the statement in Genesis 1.1 where it says God created. You see, we create with existing things. We take pieces of matter already in existence. We take a flower, we take some ferns, we take some greens, and we put them together and we say we created that. Really all we did is assemble it. We just put it together. When God created, He created out of nothing. Nothing existed prior to Genesis 1 1. 
It says, God created the heavens and the earth. And all that in them is, He created them. From nothing into something. That's creation. I read recently of a group of scientists who boasted of the fact that they had created something. Aha, see, we can be just like you say God is. We've created something. And they went on to explain the science, scientific experiment that they, that they performed. And they explained how they created this matter that came and a Christian scientist kind of poked the finger in the chest and said, well, where did those pieces come from that you started with? You see, we assemble. God creates. From nothing into something. And the scriptures confirm that truth. For example, I printed out some of those verses for you that we can read and see that this theme reverberates through Scripture. We see in Hebrews 11, verses 1 to 3, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God didn't assemble. God created. And in his creation, we have looked at the past, and I just want to remind you again today that it proves and demonstrates his omnipotence, his great power, To bring all things into existence from nothing. Creation also manifests and reveals to us his omniscience. His all knowledge. Have you ever really looked at the complexity of a rose? The color? The way it opens? They all open the same? One rose doesn't open this way and another one that way. They all open the same. And they have the little center in them that has the pollen and the leaves and the thorns. The omniscient God made that. Have you looked at the complexity of grass and the varieties of grass? Hundreds of varieties of grass. All different. Different colors. Different blades. Different heights. Creation reveals to us God's power and His knowledge. We read in Romans chapter 1 how creation will stand as the judgment bar before which all creation will stand. It says all men will stand before him guilty because God has revealed himself to them in creation. His eternal power and his divinity, his Godhead. Romans chapter 1 Verses about 15 through 18. So that men are without excuse. Creation reveals to us God. His nature. His character. His divinity. No other God like Him. We will see as we progress down through chapter 1 and and observe the the other aspects of God's creation, parts of this, all the heavens and all the earth, we will see no other God mentioned. Only one. 
No other God. Only one God. The divine, eternal one. No other God exists beside him. He does not raise to the top of a list of many. He exists alone as God. And creation reveals that to us. And we can see God's eternal power and his eternity, his divinity in the things that we see. Now you might ask, how does that connect to Jesus Christ? You said a few moments ago that the Bible provides for us a meta-story and we dare not take the parts out all by themselves, but how they connect to the rest of Scripture? I would remind you of one of the verses and the list that I have on the page for you from Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11. It begins to bring in the relationship of Jesus Christ to creation. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. John chapter 1 refers that to that very truth again, and it reverberates and repeats the same phrase even from Genesis chapter 1, and it does so in reference to Jesus. I'll read those for you. You can Turn there if you want. It's in John chapter 1, verse number 1. It says, in the beginning. (laughs) In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not a God, as some false religions like to say. No. He was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Well, who is the word? Who does that describe? Well, you have to read down a little farther through John chapter 1 to find out how John reveals to us the character and the person of the word. Drop down to verse number 14. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. The Word that existed with God. The Word that was God. The Word who created all things, and by Him all things were created that were made. That Word became flesh. We call Him Jesus. John further describes the mission of Jesus in His birth. John 3.16, we all know John 3.16 here this morning. We've repeated it many, many times, and and we have claimed its promise. God loved his creation. And he loved it to the extent that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh yes, this creation that we see described for us in Genesis chapter 1 has a definite relationship with Jesus Christ because he participated in it. He himself helped form those worlds and those heavenly bodies. That one who came as the gift of the Father to provide redemption for people like you and me who came to pay the penalty that we deserve to pay. He paid on our behalf. Well, what can we conclude from these simple truths that we've reviewed this morning and examined from God's Word? They describe for us God, not all of God, but certainly some aspects of God that we can understand and know His existence, 
his existence before creation, his creating all things from nothing, the participation of his son in that creation, and the further revelation of that son who came on behalf of people like you and me to pay the penalty for our sin and the sin of multitudes of people like us that by faith in him we might have eternal life. We can know those truths and we can grasp them and this morning they can encourage us and remind us of truths that we have believed for many years. Well, how can the Spirit of God apply these truths to our lives today? I think that Revelation chapter 4 describes it very clearly for us. He is worthy. He is worthy to receive honor and glory. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our obedience. He is worthy of our trust and our faith and casting it upon him solely and exclusively. He deserves it. He alone is God. And he has manifested himself to us. And we can know him. We can call upon him. We can trust him. I say for the sake of those who will listen at another time to the message that I have given to you this morning. I know each of you and you have confirmed to me that you have trusted this one who participated with the Father in creation. But some may listen to this at a time in the future who have never trusted him. And to those I would encourage you to call upon Christ as we have and found his promises true in our lives and we know because of God's faithfulness that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's his promise. That's his promise. Well, let's close our time together this morning in prayer. And thank him for his wondrous gift to us.